is everyone today? Good. Good. Well, I'm not going to hold on for one more sec, but you'll, you'll find out who I am later if you don't know already. Anyhow, welcome to our inaugural program, uh, Writing the Balance, asking the question, can there be gender parity in the arts? More importantly, when? This is the first event in the National Museum of Women in the Arts, new Women Arts and Social Change program initiative. Its goal is to take the three core principles upon which the museum was founded, arts, women, and the social action that created the museum, and create programs that can and will make a difference. Uh, this, uh, this programming explicitly champions uh, women in the arts as catalysts for change. It will place the arts within the larger context of women's creativity and innovation, and it will situate art and artists within a variety of disciplines, businesses, and peer groups whose processes, experimentation, and risk-taking are very much like artists' own practices. Why? Because when artists are linked in with women succeeding in areas as diverse as technology, architecture, conflict resolution, social justice, or environmental conservation, their work will be recognized and their work will be seen as necessary rather than niceties, mainstream rather than marginal. And for the Women's Museum, located as we are in Washington, D.C., we are uniquely suited to deliver that steady drumbeat of curated, socially conscious programming wrapped around women in the arts. For this first Fresh Talk program that launches our initiative, uh, we're going to ease into things. We're going to acknowledge the elephant in the room, and we are going to clean up our own backyard. Gender equity issues are gaining unprecedented visibility, and as a follow-up on the June 2015 Art News issue, uh, NIMWA is offering the first series of creative conversations around the inequality that persists for women artists and the strategies that we will recalibrate, with your help, the art world's sexist machinery. At the rate things are going today, we should be able to delve into this, to this topic for the next seven to ten years. <laughs> but who knows, perhaps through our actions we'll be able to reach a tipping point sooner than that. I wish to thank all of today's speakers in our Writing the Balanced program, whose impressive biographies uh, you can read in today's program. You all have your programs? Great. And then I especially want to thank Maura Riley, who agreed with alacrity and conviction on a phone call this past spring when I think we were both in New York but on different parts of the, uh, in different parts of Manhattan. She agreed to work with NIMWA on this event. I also want to express my warmest appreciation to our new head of public programs, Lori Mertes, program coordinator Kaylee Bryan Greenwell, for all their great ideas and good work, as well as the many members of the museum staff and friends who helped make today possible. And I reserve and give my deepest thanks to our leadership funders who have made the dream of women, arts, and social change programming a reality here at the museum. It took five years for the idea to gestate, three years for us to find a funder, and now I feel like we're, after years of headwind, we're starting to get that slipstream tailwind that's going to take us forward. So I want to recognize uh, Denise Littlefield Sobel, who's here with us today. Denise, would you please stand up? As well as the ML Dowry, Dowry Arts Initiative, Lorna Meyer Callis and Dennis Callis and also the Swartz Foundation. I hope that everyone here today enjoys and is galvanized by the program about achieving gender parity in the arts, and I also invite you to join us for upcoming women arts and social change programming. Thank you to all of you in the audience for coming out today to talk for a few hours on a, this very important issue, and also for joining us for Sunday Supper, where the conversation will continue, and I'm sure will be extremely lively. 
Now it's my honor uh, to turn the program over to Lori Mertes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Um, rules of engagement, not rules, you know, more like guidelines. Um, you want to leave your phone on mute, but I want you to leave your phone on because we do want you to help share the conversation today. So you have a hashtag, Fresh Talk, the number four, change. And I hope you get that tweet out there or your Instagram photos, et cetera. So more power to spreading the word. Susan talked about action. And today's a little bit different. That's why we're sort of talking a little bit about how things are going to go on. We're going to have a variety of different sessions. We will not have a Q&A session today. The amazing group of people who are here today have lots to share on the subject of gender parity in the art world. But the the responsibility or the burden of answering the question of can there be gender parity in the art world really relies on all of us. And we all need to participate in what we're crafting in terms of the action items that we can leave here with today. And so we're going to turn the answer portion over to the audience, to you all at supper tonight. And so when we all gather for supper at the Great Hall, family style, um, we will have microphones for you to choose to stand up and have your two minutes to talk about what today inspired you, what today captured your imagination, what did you think about when you heard that. And we also have a few cards where we're hoping again to capture those same kinds of thoughts, if you're too shy to get up and speak. But I hope you're not. I hope that you, sh you stand up, everyone gets two minutes, and no whining. <laughs> We've been whining long enough. <laughs> I like the giggles. So those are the sort of initial rules of engagement. Um, I really do thank all of our speakers, and I do thank Kaylee Bryant-Greenwell, our new public programs coordinator, who is downstairs um, eight and a half months pregnant, still pulling off this program, and um, we welcome Lorelai when she comes to visit us. So Kaylee, I know you're watching because we're live streaming right now. So, um, I'm going to turn it over to Maura and have a great time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. All right, so we're using this baby, right? Actually, you should get your PowerPoint up in a moment. Okay, great. Um, Thank you, Lori, for um, inviting me, and, and thank you, Susan. This is a real honor and a privilege to be here speaking with you all. Uh, my goal is to give a sort of overview of, of the statistics and, um, you know, the, the sort of numbers of what we're looking at today as far as male to female ratio in the art world. Women artists are certainly in a far better position today than they were 45 years ago when Linda Nochlin wrote her landmark essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? And they definitely hold a far more respectable professional status than they have throughout history. For one thing, access to higher education, to which women had historically been denied, is now possible for many, at least with finan financial means. Moreover, the institutional power structures that in her essay, Linda Nochlin argued, had made it impossible for women to achieve artistic excellence on the same footing as men, have been shifting, if ever so slightly. And women themselves, who Nochlin cautioned against puffing mediocrity, have since taken the necessary risks and the leaps into the unknown that the author suggested were required for women to achieve greatness. So of course the barriers are shifting, but they have not yet lifted. In other words, it's important not to be seduced by what appear to be signs of full equality in the art world, for it must be stated and restated that women have never been, nor are they yet, treated on a par with men. Upon investigating price differentials, ratios in museums and galleries, within thematic and national exhibitions and in the press, the numbers demonstrate that the fight for equality is far from over. 
Indeed, the more closely one examines the art world statistics, the more glaringly obvious it becomes that despite the decades of post-colonial feminist, anti-racist, um, anti and queer activism, the majority continues to be defined as white, Euro-American, heterosexual, privileged, and above all, male. When perusing the majority of mainstream museums, for instance, one must search more diligently for the women artists and the artists of color. Without question, the art world has not yet is not yet concerned with the full assimilation of work by minority, post-colonial, or any other voice into the larger discourse, except, of course, as a special exhibition, women artists, for instance. Sexism is still so insidiously woven into the institutional fabric, language, and logic of the mainstream art world that it often goes undetected. Once ferreted out, however, there can be no denying its prevalence. The statistics speak for themselves. A glance at the recent special exhibition schedules at major art institutions in the United States, for instance, especially the presentation of solo shows, reveals the continued prevalence of gender disparity, as you can see here on the screen. Of all the solo exhibitions since 2007 at the Whitney Museum of American Art, for instance, 31% went to women artists. That's as good as it gets in the United States. So as you can see, during a comparable time period, the figures are far worse at MoMA, Guggenheim, et cetera. The permanent exhibition displays at major institutions are equally imbalanced. So let's take a look, for instance, at MoMA. If we can move to the next slide. Can someone move? To, oh, there we go. Whoops, sorry. That was my fault. There we go. In 2014, in 2004, when MoMA reopened its expanded exhibition spaces, including a reinstallation of the permanent collection, of the 410 works in the fourth and fifth floor galleries, only a paltry 16 were women. That's 4%. And even fewer by uh, works by artists of color. At the time, art critic Jerry Saltz argued, and this is great, I think, 4% is shameless, reprehensible, and unacceptable. And he suggested that the public boycott the institution until its arrogantly parochial misrepresentation of women artists was corrected and those responsible were held accountable. To rectify the distortion, he recommended that, that the museum mount at least one retrospective of a living woman artist every year for the next 20 years. Now, a dash through these same galleries just a few weeks ago revealed some signs of improvement, but they still have a long, long way to go. As testament to the museum's continued disparity in representation, in 2014, the editors of Art Slant started a rumor, and it was in fact an April Fool's joke, that MoMA would give the museum over exclusively to women artists for the entire year of 2015. <laughs> that got quite a play on social media. Women are featured far less at galleries as well. I can get this to go. Here we go. Activists like the Gorilla Girls have been protesting this problem for decades, calling out specific galleries as sexist and holding them accountable, most spectacularly in this image on the left in their 1986 report card. More recently, the art collective Pussy Galore, whose image is on the right, updated the stats for those 19, I'm sorry, the um, New York City Gallery still open and added others to the mix. Of those still open today, comparing their stats from 1986 to 2014, the worst grades go to Leo Castelli and Tony Schifrazi. On a positive note, unlike, unlike in 1986, there are now some New York City galleries representing women more than 50% of the time, including PPOW, Gallery Lalong, Sycamore Jenkins, and others. In, 19, in 2013, artist Nicole Hebron, who's here with us today, was propelled by the preponderance propelled by the pr preponderance of male artists in gallery ads in Art Forum and in the galleries themselves, she started the Gallery Project, or Gallery Tally Project, excuse me, which we'll talk about shortly. And again, on average, um, the ratio of male to female or female to male is 32.3% in the galleries. Now, not only is work by women being undervalued by gallerists, 
If one judges from the amount of coverage allotted in magazines and other periodicals, work by women is also consistently held in lower self-esteem by the press, or lower esteem, excuse me, by the press. And this is a great image, if I can get it up, by Jerry Saltz, where he does these hysterical Facebook postings, this one called Sausage Fest, talking about the, the you know, predominance of, of um, male focus in this issue. It's worse when one compares how many articles and reviews dedicated to solo artists prefer male to female. In the December issue of Art News, for instance, there were 33 devoted to male artists and nine to female. The availability of work by women artists at galleries has a tremendous impact on the amount of press coverage they receive and the interest from collectors, museums, and so on, which in turn directly affects their market and monetary values. And this is an area of the art world where women are particularly unequal. As of 2015, for instance, the highest price paid for um, a living woman artist is $9.8 million for a Katie Nolan sculpture in comparison with a sculpture by Jeff Koons, which sold for $58.4 million, and that was an addition of five. Likewise, the most ever paid to date for a dead woman artist, wouldn't get that, I don't know why it's so slow, there we go, um, is 44.4 million for Georgia O'Keeffe versus 142 million for Francis Bacon. Now I show for you here a brand new poster by the Pussy Galore Collective that they sent to me to show today. And it's their remake of a Gorilla Girl poster which is outside, um, which is dated from the mid 80s. And if you look, it says when sexism is no longer fashionable, what will your collection be worth? And it says for that Francis Bacon that you just purchased for 142 million, you could have bought at least two works by every single one of those women artists listed below. <laughs> and includes, you know, Louise Bourgeois, Cindy Sherman, et cetera. Now, there are now several publications and online rankings which collectors can turn to for insights into market visibility of an artist who might interest them. For instance, Kunstkompass or artfacts.net. In 2014, uh, artnet.com revealed a list of the top 100 living artists over the past five years, with only six of the 100 being women. Of course, one can equate these listings with the aesthetic worth of the artist. However, these listings are symptomatic of widespread discrimination against women. Given that the battle for equality continues, in the interim, I'd like to ask us to think about what we can do to address this oppressive situation. How can we get those in power to loosen their grip? What are our choices as artists, curators, scholars, critics, collectors, to ensure a more just and fair representation in the art world? Will women ever achieve parity? And if not in our lifetimes, then what strategies can we employ to ensure an upward shift for the future? Firstly, I think it's utopian to think that the position of women in the art world is going to cease to be problematic when we live in a world where women are oppressed and discriminated against on a daily basis, from campus rape, domestic violence, street harassment, unequal pay, et cetera, et cetera. Abuse against women is as endemic as it is tolerated and ignored. Moreover, as Linda Nochlin argued in 1971, it's certainly not realistic to hope that the majority of men in the arts will soon see the light of day and find that it is in their own self-interest to grant complete equality to women. Most men, despite lip service to equality, are reluctant to give up the natural order of things in which their advantages are so great and that those who have privileges inevitably hold on to them and hold tight. Ignoring sexism certainly won't make it go away. Moreover, if we can't help others to see the structural problems, then we can't even, can't even begin to fix them. In other words, how can we get people to think about gender? How can we get those in the art world to recognize, accept, and acknowledge that there is indeed inequality of the sexes? The question becomes then, how can we elicit sympathy to point of action? How can we go about educating disbelievers who contend because there are signs of improvement 
that the battle has been won? How do we denaturalize what is perceived as natural? What can we do? Well, we can continue to speak out and talk out and to make trouble as we're doing today. We can come out as proud feminists and go public with our views. We can invite and encourage men to participate in the dialogue in and around inequality. We can begin to hold collectors hostage. We can hold museum boards and galleries accountable. We can continue to curate women only and feminist exhibitions as well as ones with gender parity. And yes, we can keep crunching the numbers. Counting is, after all, a feminist strategy. In the end, and in conclusion, instead of denying statistics or ignoring the subject of gender altogether, we need to stop making excuses and to face these issues head on in order to come up with solutions and possibilities and strategies for addressing these inequities. We need collectively to change this, to change what is, in the end, an, an abhorrent situation for women in the art world. Now is the moment for us to work together to recognize the problem, to come to a resolution, so that all peoples and their creative outputs can have equal opportunity. By calling attention to these disparities, like the Gorilla Girls and Gallery Tally and Pussy Galore and others are doing, we can undermine the state of false consciousness that all is okay in the art world, and to debunk the myth of gender equality. But in the end, let's not just talk about feminism, let's live it. Let's take more concrete actions. Don't just tweet and post about feminism. Let's call out the institutions and the critics and the curators and the collectors and the gallerists for their sexist practices. With just a little bit more energy and action, creating a more just art world doesn't have to be a pipe dream. Thank you. <laughs>